Good morning and welcome. I'm so glad to have you joining us today as we continue our study of the gospel of Matthew. And um, we just want to welcome you and thank you for persevering and coming um, either to the church this morning or um, tuning into your Zoom groups online. Um, we are so grateful um, that even when our resources or our circumstances um, make us feel insufficient or realize our insufficiency, that God is sufficient. And so he has been sufficient in allowing us to continue to meet, and we thank him for that. Um, I'm going to open us in prayer, and we'll dive into our lesson this week. Father, how we just thank you for the chance to study your word, and we thank you that you're always teaching us and growing us. And that even in the midst of storms we have faced or are facing this week, um, that you come to us, that you are with us, and that you provide for us. And that in those storms and in those challenging times, um, you want us to see you working. You want us to look for you. And you want to be very real in our lives if we will um, pay attention. And so, God, um, help us to do that today as we gaze at these scriptures and um, grow our faith. Uh, even in um, difficult or challenging spaces, grow our faith as we see you work um, when we've come to the end of ourselves. Um, may this time be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so um, we have been talking about uh, Jesus and how he is um, uh, teaching the crowds and starting to focus in on the disciples a little bit about his kingdom and how many um, how much of it is so unexpected. And last week uh, we studied the parables, um, several parables um, that talked about some unexpected realities of the kingdom. And Jesus was sharing these truths specifically with his disciples, really trying to pour into them and teach them more. And so last week we learned about three unexpected realities of the kingdom. And we learned that it is a kingdom with unstoppable power that it is a kingdom of unparalleled value, and that it is also uh, a kingdom that requires an unavoidable response. And that as believers, those of us who are believers, we are responsible to share this truth um, of this great treasure uh, with others. And so today we're entering into the fourth uh, section or the fourth discourse um, uh, in Matthew's discourses. And so in opening up this fourth section is chapter 15. And the fourth section um, is found in chapters 15 through 18. And, and so we open with chapter 15 and, and a lot of action in this chapter. And then it closes um, in a few lessons with chapter 18, where Jesus gives some discourse on the church. And so in this section, we're seeing um, Jesus really uh, use these different uh, circumstances and um, different things that they encounter, he and his disciples, uh, to, to teach the disciples um, uh, and kind of challenge some of their different expectations about the Messiah. Um, Jesus did not come to be a military or a political king, but truly a suffering servant. And so um, he was pouring into uh, those disciples and preparing them for their mission ahead. Um, and so uh, some of you may remember back in the 80s and 90s uh, became really popular something called magic eye art and it's where you have a design on a poster or a painting and you gaze at it and it maybe just looks like this intricate design or maybe it, it looks like one thing but as you gaze at it eventually um, a different image or sometimes almost like a 3D image starts to jump off of the page. And so, um, you know, that, that uh, illustration is a great example of what happens when we gaze at something long enough. Sometimes for, for some of us gazing at those funny pictures, it seems like it takes us forever to see something. Um, but for other people, it jumps right off the page. Uh, but what we're seeing here this week is that the disciples are spending time with Jesus. They're watching him and learning from him. And they are starting to truly realize, even if they don't fully understand all the details truly realize that he is the son of God. And so we're going to look at this week um, in two main sections. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 14. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 14. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I don't know how many interruptions we'll have, but we will try to continue. God 
willing. Um, so we're going to look at two sections and let me see if I can pull up our PowerPoint here for you guys just to show you our outline. Here we go. There we go. All right, so um, lesson 15, Matthew chapter 14, sufficient for our insufficiency. And we're gonna see this throughout this chapter and I've divided it into two sections. Um, Matthew uh, 14, one through 21, we'll see that Jesus, only Jesus is sufficient to satisfy. And then in the second division, Matthew 14, 22 through 36, that only Jesus is sufficient to save. The big idea is um, of course, Christ's sufficiency. And our aim or, or the big truth that we want to understand in this lesson is that only Jesus Christ can fully satisfy all of our spiritual needs. Only he is sufficient to do that. Our attribute is that he is good. He is um, one with God and um, God is good and Jesus is good as well. And our doctrine this week is God the Son. And so we're going to be looking um, a little more deeply. Let's go ahead and dive into section one. Um, starting in verse one, we hear that, um, you know, Jesus was performing all these miracles and that Herod um, was starting to get a little paranoid or starting to think that it was perhaps John the Baptist risen from the dead. Um, now, we don't have any record that John performed miracles, but perhaps he did, or perhaps because um, Herod had heard him teach and, and knew that something about him was different. And certainly he was a man of God. Um, he thought that maybe um, Jesus uh, perhaps was John the Baptist risen from the dead. And then we get some background on this story um, in verses three and following all the way to verses 12, that basically the reason John had died was because he had been beheaded. He had been killed by Herod uh, because he called Herod out for um, taking his brother's wife as his own. And he told them, hey, this is sin. Um, and this is wrong. And so Herodias, Herod's wife, who was also his niece, who was also his sister-in-law, very complicated situation there, but um, she hated John and um, very much wanted to have him killed. And Herod um, caves to that pressure and also the pressure of um, some dinner guests when Herodias basically um, tricked Herod and um, her own daughter um, involving um, her in a plot to try and have John the Baptist killed. And so we get this whole background story. And so it makes sense that Herod might be feeling a little paranoid or feeling guilty about having killed an innocent man. Or maybe um, we get some other information in other gospels that Herod actually liked listening to John. So maybe he was curious and, and hoped that he had somehow risen from the dead because he was um, convicted and um and just overwhelmed with guilt about the wrong that he had done and so um we know that the people in that herodian dynasty loved power um we saw this with herod the great when he uh, had all of the baby boys in bethlehem killed um we we saw it uh we see it here um when herod uh chooses pride um over doing what's right in front of his dinner guests um and, you know, he, Herod, nor his wife liked being confronted with that pride. And we see how even what seems like just a, a seed or an internal um, struggle or sin has snowballed when, when left unchecked and, and has led to the point of murder. And so um, Herod, because he wanted to save face in front of his guests, and this is what it says in verse 9, it says, the king was distressed but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in prison. And so, you know, this sin started a long time ago when Herod saw his brother, his brother Philip's wife and wanted her. So that sin of envy. And then later that pride of wanting the approval of others and it eventually led to murder. And that is what can happen with unchecked sin in our lives. And we see here that a sad lesson that ultimately Herod chose pride over courage. Um, he did claim to be a practicing Jew, um, but he lacked the courage to stand up for what was right and to stand up for truth. And he thought that his power would come from the approval of others. And that was what most concerned him in the situation. And sadly, um, that was what led to John's death in the situation. 
And so I think there's some lessons we can learn even from this first section. Um, and we know that sometimes we're like Herod. We often have insufficient courage to stand up for truth because of our desire to be accepted by others um, or because of our desire um, for something that we think will satisfy us. In the case of Herod, he wanted that political power and he wanted that approval of the people. And so we see the response of John's disciples in verse 12. It says they came and took his body and buried it. And then they went and told Jesus. And so they bury his body. Um, they asked for it, first of all, which took great courage after what had just happened to John. And then they honor him with their actions. After that, they go and tell Jesus. Um, perhaps they were going to tell Jesus, okay, we're ready to follow you now, John is gone. Perhaps they were going to tell Jesus just because they were mourning and wanted to be close to him. Or perhaps they had struggles and questions and doubts. And so they wanted to go and tell Jesus and ask him, what's next? Why is this happening? And it surely, um, whatever their reason or whatever, um, uh, their questions, it was a comfort for them to encounter Jesus. And it's an example for us to go to Jesus in our own time of need. Why? Because he is, is there to comfort us. He was, um, he came to earth as a man to be our example and to live in this world that we have to live in. Hebrews 4 uh, verse 14 through 16 says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us Hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this is what they did and Jesus was with them. And then we see Jesus even had a response. Um, in this next section, we see verses 13 through 21. We see the humanity of Jesus in these first few verses. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And so Jesus, he was human. He was fully human. And he had limits. He was exhausted and depleted because of the, the physical uh, demands of the schedule he had been keeping. But he was also mourning the loss of this great prophet and his friend and cousin, the person who had baptized him and helped inaugurate his ministry on earth. And yet even still, we see his response when um, he comes to this crowd of people in need and he had compassion. Despite his own need, he was focused on others and not on himself. Um, Matthew chapter nine and Mark chapter six, uh, both say that when he looked on the crowds, it, he had compassion on them because it was like they were sheep without a shepherd. And um, in this next section, we see the disciples, um, you know, that they're just seeing uh, the need and thinking of it as a burden. Um, and that kind of contrasts the way that Jesus sees this as an opportunity for blessing the crowds and also teaching his disciples. And, um, and so these disciples saw this need. They said, well, um, this is a remote place. It's getting late. Please send the crowds away so they can um, go to the villages and get themselves some food. And then Jesus replies to them. He says, they don't need to go away you give them something to eat. And um, Jesus was grieving and yet he still gave of himself. And then as the evening approached and these disciples were starting to worry, this huge crowd, it was dinner time, they would need some food. And Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat. And so the disciples, um, instead of being focused on the crowd and their needs and having that compassion, they were focused on their own insufficiencies. And they wanted the problem to go away. Let's be honest. And a lot of us are like that sometimes. Let these people go and take care of their own needs. Yet Jesus wanted those disciples to feel compassion for the needs of the crowd. And in our own power, it's a lot easier to forget about the needs of others. But when Christ's power is working in us and through us, he enables us to feel compassion towards others. And as we follow his example and depend on his power and his sufficiency, rather than our own uh, lack of power or our own insufficiencies, we're able to focus on others' needs rather than those insufficiencies or the, or the ways that we fall short or the circumstances may fall short. 
So the disciples, they had some meager resources. They had five loaves and two fishes, but certainly wasn't enough to feed uh, possibly 20,000 total people. Um, a loaf of bread at that time would have fed approximately three people. And so they said, well, uh, this is what we've got. This is all we've got, five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says, bring them here to me. He had everybody sit down. And then he took those meager, insufficient resources, lifted them to heaven, gave thanks and broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And the disciples were focused on the insufficiency of those meager loaves, those five loaves and two fish. But when they brought their insufficient resources to Jesus, he thanked God for what he was going to do in advance. And then he multiplied those meager resources to overflowing. How often in our own lives do we focus on our five loaves and two fish? When we're asked to serve, we often look at our limited talents, our limited time, our insufficient knowledge, or limited capabilities, and we think there is no way we can offer anything of value. Or when we see a need, once again, we focus on our five loaves and two fish and think that it's impossible to make a difference, to contribute something of significance. We think the magnitude of need is so far beyond us, but it's not about us. It is about Christ. And what Christ wants for us is to bring our limited resources to him with thanksgiving and trust that he will do the rest. <clears throat> Christ, Jesus Christ, the son of God, who is all sufficient, is able to take whatever we bring to him with thanksgiving and multiply it. He can complete and perfect all of our insufficiencies because Jesus meets our insufficiency with his perfect sufficiency. Even though he was a man who walked on this earth, he was the son of God, the only son of God. And so he has all the power and resources that God the Father has. And that brings us to our first truth that only Jesus is sufficient to completely satisfy all of our needs. Only Jesus is sufficient to completely satisfy all of our needs. <clears throat> so what pressing need do you have in your life right now? Is it something physical or spiritual? Maybe a relational or emotional need? You know, it's not the need being fulfilled that is actually going to satisfy you, at least not in any lasting way. Not the conflict being resolved or the bank account being filled or the extra time to rest. While those are all good and important things that often do bring some satisfaction, rest assured it will only be temporary. But the person of Jesus himself son of God and savior of man. He is the one source sufficient to meet all of our needs and satisfy us. And not just for today, but forever and ever. Where do you need to confess that you have been waiting and believing something or someone else for satisfaction? That one hurts. Maybe it's my spouse my spouse's attention or approval, my children's good behavior. Maybe it's approval from my parents or um, friends or another group. Maybe it's a promotion or some type of acknowledgement for the work I do um, outside of the home, inside of the home in a ministry. All of these things will fall short eventually. The only place to find lasting satisfaction is a person, Jesus, son of God, savior and provider for you and for me. Now let's look at our next section where we'll see um, in verses 22 through 36 that Jesus is sufficient to save. And in this next section, we see that Jesus sent his beloved disciples into this faith testing life threatening storm. And we will see how God purposefully ex lets us experience our inadequacies and insufficiencies. Um, but um, again, that is not without purpose. And so in verse 22, 
it says immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself. Ooh, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When the evening came, he was there alone. And now John 6 gives us a little more detail um, that says Jesus knew that the crowds um, were about to force him to become king. So he immediately dismisses them and he gets his disciples um, out of that situation, uh, perhaps to remove them from the chaos that he knew would ensue if he stuck around, or um, perhaps just to remove them um, from further temptation to think that he was going to become some sort of political or military king. Uh, perhaps it was even to remove himself from um, just the overwhelming weight or temptation of that situation. But he goes and sends these guys to a place of, once again, insufficiency as they are headed into the storm and he knows it. And then he himself goes up to the mountainside to be alone. And he um, had, had attempted to do this earlier in the same day, but we see that Jesus pursues time alone with God. And um, this is something that so many of us hear about and talk about, um, and yet uh, find such a hard time actually doing and prioritizing. And I really want to encourage you, um, whatever season of life you're in, if God is calling you away to be with him, don't give up on that. And I know it can be so hard when you have children in your home. Um, I had many years of having little children in my home this week. I have uh, grade school children and they are all in my home doing virtual school. Um, and so uh, there are all different seasons of life where there is a lot of noise. And I know many of you are a full-time or part-time caretaker for someone who has a lot of needs. Um, and I do believe that even in those um, seasons that are demanding and hard to rest, that God still wants to speak. Um, and that if he is calling you to um, an hour or five minutes or two days um, away um, that you will pray and say, God, I don't have the resources. To, I don't have the time where I can find this. So I need you to meet me and to give me what I need um, to go and be with you. And he will. Um, I had a season where I really struggled um, several years ago after having kids, just physical exhaustion and emotional exhaustion and um, some health issues. And um, I had uh, just a time where I was really um, weighed down by the desire to just get away and not to get away and go on a trip or go to a spa or, or go um, any particular place. I just wanted to get away and be alone. And um, you can imagine the relief I felt when I read a book and it's been one of the um, most encouraging books I've read in my adult life, but that said a deep, desperate desire to get away and be alone is a desire for God. And when I read that line, I was just overcome with tears and weeping, thinking, okay, there's nothing wrong with me. I just want to be with you, God. And so if um, I do believe that Jesus is giving us this example here, that we all need that time. And sometimes in some seasons, we may have just a little bit, and then there may be other seasons where God provides more time. But Jesus um, didn't give up on that call to go be with God. He, he was a little bit interrupted, so to speak, um, by putting others' needs before his own, but then he pursued that, and um, that way he could go and be with his father alone to pray. It says in verse 24, the boat was already a considerable distance from the land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it, and so um, later it says, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake, and Jesus was alone and praying knew they were going into the storm, and he allowed them to labor for many hours in their own insufficient uh, human strength before he went out and came to them. Um, and it says he came, went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking, they were terrified. It's a ghost. They were so afraid. Um, but have you ever experienced this, how God calls you out of your comfort zone and into faith-testing, life-altering storms? You know, maybe, maybe um, a, a season in your family life. Um, I know for us um, in BSF leadership around the world, um, we have been in uncertain waters and uncertain territory for almost two years now. 
But we also know if life was all smooth sailing, we really wouldn't ever realize how insufficient our own human strength actually is. And if it was always smooth sailing, do you think that you or I would ever learn to fully depend on God rather than depending on our own abilities or strength? You know, last year, all these stories we looked at in Genesis in the Bible um, of, of so many Bible heroes, um, did any of those guys or girls get to stay in smooth waters? No. We saw Abraham called to leave everything and wait a lifetime for an heir. And we saw Sarah, uh, who doubted um, but wanted to believe that she would have a child. We saw Jacob spending years in a foreign land because of family favoritism and his own bad choices and broken family relationships. We saw Joseph betrayed by his own brothers and sold into slavery. Even Jesus himself and each one of his disciples would face storms and challenges and times of suffering and multiple times in their lives, a fork in the road where the, the, they would come to over and over. Do I depend on myself or do I depend on God? And so we see um, in this situation, Jesus is using the storm to teach his disciples to depend on him. And what does he tell them to do in verse 27? He comes to them and he says, take courage. It is I don't be afraid. And in their insufficiency, once again, Jesus comes to them meets them in their place of need. They're at the very edge of a faltering faith, um, but Jesus is hoping to use that edge and grow their faith, stretch their faith. And um, so he allowed them to strive and to work. Um, and just like the Jewish people and even ourselves, a lot of times in our own religious efforts, we row and we row and we row and we are completely insufficient to save ourselves from the crushing waves of sin that threaten to destroy our lives and our world. But we all have a lifeline that is sufficient and he's not waiting for us to get our act together or to have more faith or to read through the entire Bible and then come to him. No, he comes right to us in our fearful, broken, insufficient storms. You know, <laughs> even right now, I am experiencing limits on my time and my space and my home. Um, and, you know, I've, I've learned this and I'm having to learn it again now um, that throughout my life, I want the easy path. Um, but it's often not there. Um, and it's often almost always, um, on the challenging path where I have to, uh, depend on God. Um, things like parenting, um, things like aging family. Um, even my husband right now is grieving as his father declines very rapidly, um, with, uh, memory loss. And, um, uh, just a, a severe condition that is um, makes us feel a little bit helpless. Um, and um, even, you know, uh, in the last year, so much um, has been unknown for so many people uh, because of COVID and changing plans or experiencing loss or loneliness. Um, even our needs um, in BSF this year and last year have at times seemed overwhelming and insufficient. And I just wanna um, say, if you do see um, our children's supervisors today, um, Jennifer or Wendy, um, or any of those children's leaders, please give them a hug and a high five. They have um, worked so hard um, with about half of leaders um, available uh, last week and this week um, to try and reshuffle classes and find volunteers and keep um, those classes open so that your children can continue um, to study God's word. And even though it's not necessarily the path we would choose or want, uh, we do see God working. And um, I love in this next section, we see this exchange with Peter. Peter has this mix of faith and doubt. He says, if it's you, tell me to come to you. Jesus says, come. So Peter jumps out of the boat. He walks a little bit, and then he gets overwhelmed by the circumstances around him and starts to sink. But what does he do? He cries out to the Lord, the only one who can save him. And immediately, Jesus reaches out and catches him. And he says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? He says, they climbed into the boat and the wind died down, and those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. And in those closing verses, 34 through 36, we see that the crowds return, 
the ministry continues, the mission continues, and Jesus continues to heal the sick, and he is not deterred from his mission, um, and his disciples still have a lot to learn, but they surely learned a valuable lesson on this day, and they were beginning to see Jesus for tr who he truly was, worshiping him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Because that day, those disciples had personally experienced his power and deliverance, had personally participated in his sufficient and overflowing provision for a hungry crowd. They had experienced him delivering them from the peril of a powerful storm. And this intense personal experience led them to worship and declare the truth that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. He is and always has been fully God. He has always existed and functions with equality and unity with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, one God, three parts that is so hard for us to understand at times and so much mystery. But we see here that even though he was a man physically present with them, he had power and dominion over nature and power to calm that storm and to save them from it. And so we see in that great love because he humbled himself to come to earth and be with us, taking on human flesh, not just so he could save the disciples from this one storm, so, but so that he could be, save us all and be the savior of mankind. In our sin and in our insufficiency, God knew there was no way we could attain the perfection that he requires. But Jesus, the perfect sinless son of God, died to pay for our sins, iniquities, and insufficiencies. And he was able, sufficient, to rise from the grave and declare victory over sin and death, things that we could never do. Jesus is the only one sufficient to save, the only one who could possibly restore the fellowship with God that sin had destroyed. He will come again, surely, and this time it will be to judge the world and to set up his eternal kingdom. And every knee will, knee will bow before him, he will be praised and worshiped for all eternity. He came to earth out of a deep love for you and for me to save us in our time of need and in the different storms and situations we find ourselves in life. Whether it's to take us out of that storm or to let us stay there a while, but yet to find peace and abundance in life, knowing that he is on our side and then to give us that promise of life eternal and peace eternal as we have access and fellowship with God, not just now, but for all eternity. Only Jesus had the sufficient power and ability to do this. And so that's our second truth that only Jesus is sufficient to save both now and for eternity. Only Jesus is sufficient to save now and for eternity. And so only he has the solutions for the storms that you are facing right now. Only he can give us that salvation from sin that secures our place in heaven with him. So what storm are you facing right now? Are you afraid? Or maybe you're just tired of rowing in the darkness. How can you find comfort or even cease striving and rowing just for a little while against the storm, knowing that Jesus is coming to you right where you are? He's able to make it stop, but he's also eager to teach you to keep your eyes on him, to trust that he is good, and to take your focus off of the wind and the waves. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it comes to us now in our time of need. And thank you that you are a very real person who saves us, not just from the different storms of life that we find here um, in our, our earthly lives, but from the storm of sin that invaded the earth. Um, and you came to completely conquer and defeat it. And so God, um, we just pray that our lives um, this week, no matter what we face, would glorify you, would see us watching and waiting and seeing you more and more clearly as we continue to look for and wait on your perfect sufficiency for every situation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Y'all have a great week.